So what do I do? Um, okay, so now yeah, we're, we're open. Yeah, ready we're to go. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I, I will get trained on this. Okay, <laughs> good morning, everyone. This is the Elementary School Building Committee meeting of November 4th, and we are conducting this virtually by Zoom per the governor's orders. So my first order of business is to make sure we have a forum and to make sure every quorum and to make sure everyone can see, hear and be heard. So I am just gonna call out names to um, have people confirm that they're here and can be heard. Paul? Present. Jonathan? Here. Ben? Present. Sean? Here. Rupert? I'm here. Mike? Here. And Steve? Here. And we, as, as you know, we are also joined by Margaret Wood and Bob Stevens from Answer. And um, I, we are waiting for a few more people, but we're going to start the meeting um, because uh, Mike has to leave early. He, he's going to be with us for about 45 minutes, so I would like to get going. Um, the first uh, thing on the agenda is to tell you what happened at the MSBA panel on Tuesday. Um, it was my first time participating in such a panel, and I actually logged on a bit early to listen to interviews uh, to watch how that process works, which was also um, an interesting process. We ended up with a short list of three, which was the goal, and those were Donesco, LPAA, and JCJ Moody Nolan. And um, I don't, both Mike and and Ben were there, and we were three voting members out of 16 people. Um, so our, our vote ends up mattering a lot. And the way they do the process is they go around the room on each individual uh, applicant and gather up information from people on what they saw or anything missing. Then uh, they ask the three from the town, um, okay, if you're gonna go for three, tell us about that and why. And the rest of them go around the room and say what their three would be. Then we stop and we vote. You know, so we, it was a lot of vetting before we voted. So, you know, Mike and Ben, I don't want to be the only one speaking. So I don't know whether you want to speak to at all what came up on each of these, starting with maybe Donesco on what people said. I took notes so I can say what others said as well. Um, Mike or Ben? Yeah, I think uh, there was a lot of po favorable reaction to Danisco. Um, you know, what I was recalling, I did not take notes. So Kathy, you'll, you'll, okay. yours will be better than mine. But um, what they found is that it's a sort of tried and true firm, done a lot of MSPA projects. And I think they indicated once towns had went to Danisco, they, they continue to work with them, which is generally I think, the best piece of feedback you can get is, uh, so that that's some of the details I remember on Danisco. Uh, Kathy or Ben, you can certainly add. A, a, a few more, they, they both have lots of experience, including with elementary. Um, one of the MSBA commenters said they particularly liked the educational focus and the way they um, the application was put together. And the the discussion of sites with a lot on um, wastewater and net zero, and they have three net zero schools um, they're working on one. So those were all really strong positives. Um, and Mike, you know, I had the, the one comment from an MSBA person, once a district has worked with them, they can't say enough about them. You know, it was like they, they rave about them. And then the other was they, they did give us cost information on each of the applicants and where they, how their averages were compared to other average. And they're on the low side of costs. Um, so they bring their, they bring their schools in um, with cost targets. Good morning, Allison. <laughs> Glad you could join us. So we're just, we, the three finalists, just as you're coming on, are Donesco, LPAA, and JCJ Moody Nolan. So Ben, anything to add on Donesco on what we heard? No, I, I also didn't take notes, but that was, that was pretty much the, the gist of what I recall from that conversation. So on LPAA, again, um, they came up 
as having lots of, not lots of schools, that they only come in once in a while when they really want another project. And they, they are returned, they, the cities that have worked with them. And I actually drove out to two of their schools. The only thing I could see was the outside of them. <laughs> but um, the way they were situated and the, the surrounding area was, um, in, these are new, newer schools and both of them were featured in our write-ups. And one of them was in just a gorgeous setting. So they use the outdoors a lot um, for the programs. And um, so any other insights on LPAA? Because they the, all the comments were really positive on them. Um, so I would say one thing that MSBA noted that, and it was particularly on this proposal, is they are gonna ask them and they're gonna ask all three of them, tell us how you meet the women and minority standards. Um, and this project in particular looked on the minority side sort of a, there was a question mark, um, had they really hit it? And um, so that that is one of actually the MSBA questions <laughs> that they're going to be asking of all of all of them in the interviews. So JCJ, Moody Nolan. Mike or Ben, do you want to jump in first? Um, yeah, I can I can start. I think this was uh, it was interesting because there was both lots of excitement and lots of questions is the way I would describe it. Um, there's a lot of excitement about Moody Nolan being involved and the reputation Moody Nolan has, some of their work. Um, they felt like it was a, it was a good application. Uh, the questions around how they're going to work, similar to ours, frankly, it mirrored our conversation. How are they going to work together? What's the model? We see a little chart with what the model is that needs a lot more explanation. I think two people said explicitly. Uh, something along the lines of, you know, if they short, if they get shortlisted, we want to have a lot of questions and dialogue about who does what. Um, but also genuine excitement about the application and, and potential work uh, with both firms. Um, uh, that's sort of what I recall. Uh, and the, the one other, um, the, you know, the MSBA on the panel is great. You know, clearly they're, they're a big spender on this, but one other on the question of who does what is they said the architect that Moody Nolan has proposed as a team member is not registered in Massachusetts. Um, so, you know, just really wondering about whether there's duplicative effort or not. And um, one of the schools they did I got to get inside. I didn't expect to. Um, the Barack Obama School in New Haven, I drove down to take a look at it and we were invited inside. And then later I looked on, it's a gorgeous school. You know, everything about it would make, it's an elementary school up through grade four with little kids in it, pre-K. But the they had a, a sub architect, they were the lead JCJ and they had a Connecticut firm and the Connecticut firm features a lot of what went into the building and why it was done and JCJ didn't do as much. So I was just wondering which did, who did what on that project. And so it was a question. So we also ended up with the five questions that we're going to ask. And Margaret, you probably got it on your screen, but we that we were limited to three. For, and this is for the interviews. Yeah, Mike. Can I just make uh, one or two more comments that might be sure. helpful for the, for the team? Sorry. So one was, I think JCJ was at or slightly below the average cost. Maybe you said that and maybe I missed it. Um, no, I did, yeah. But I think the other thing to note is those three were significantly above in terms of the vote count, the others, but there were four votes for TSKP and uh, one person, uh, Steve, you'll be happy to hear, loved Jonathan Levy or Levy uh, Architects and voted them as top firm and acknowledged that they felt like the work wasn't reflected in the application, that, that the quality of the work didn't, didn't match that. So there were five total firms that received votes. Uh, the top three were all over 20 votes. Uh, TSKP had four votes and Jonathan Levy Architects had three votes. Uh, but I just wanted, because there was people on the team that were advocating uh, or feeling strongly about the other ones. And then the last three firms, I think Tecton, T2, and uh, DRA. DRA did not receive a vote um, by anyone on the, on the panel, just to round out the, the experience for everybody. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, and, and Steve, the, the, the advocate for Levy also picked the three firms it was 
the three firms that person picked were all because of the high level of design, you know, and this was an architect. And so JCJ, uh, TSKP, and Levy were that per person's choice of three, you know, zoned in right on. Yeah. So I, I get one other thing, just very yeah. briefly, one of the things that was interesting, uh, the three of us did not have this identical rankings. Right. So I actually think that's a good thing, right? You know, yeah. it was like, there wasn't a, a team approach uh, on the front end. And, and I think uh, MSBA recognized that and, and complimented that, that it wasn't a prearranged thing. We clearly had done our homework. Um, I think one person said they'd watched our meeting, the, this meeting, you know, where we talked about it and they're really impressed with the level of dialogue that uh, this team had on there. And I think that was reflected in our ability to participate effectively. So I just wanna thank everyone for their feedback because. It certainly made me better, and I think I can speak for Kathy and Ben that yep. it made us better uh, when we're actually on the panel because of the depth of dialogue we had at this meeting, the two meetings prior. Absolutely, you know, we we didn't even have the th the same three firms. Um, I was one of the TSKP votes, but the, the other thing they they said about us, um, and it is again because of the discussion we came in with is we knew a lot and they 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 said this town came in with a lot more insights and having very closely read the, the proposals and i don't know what the norm is um with this amount of money at stake but they they were very praiseworthy of what we'd done and they did also note that we had um made public all of the applications after they came in and it wasn't so much a criticism but as to let everyone know that we had done that on the panel so it was an interesting experience and we have the we'll send you all in writing the five questions um the msba is going to do the one on minority and women and they also have a fairly complicated question but it worked when i watched the interviews they want to know um and this one you will love rupert um they want to know how complicated the systems are that are being put in place um and how much effort both cost to run them later and and what do you do because they've been watching more and more sophisticated with net zero but other kinds of features that aren't always that easy to run and do you have manuals? So that's one of their stand, that will be one of their questions on it. And we have, Margaret, why don't you um, give the three that we ended up with? Out of, we had we had eight questions or nine when we came out of our meeting last time, but they would only take three from us, so. Right, so I'll just, I'll read them and I'll put them in the meeting notes. Um, the I, I'm not sure which order that the architects will take these on, but they're provided to the architects, they've already been provided to the architects and they're asked to address them in their formal presentation. So they get you know, about 25, 30 minutes to make a formal presentation. And then there's about 20 minutes for Q and A. Um, so th there will be an opportunity to ask other questions. So some of the questions that you had um, generated, I recommended to Kathy be used during the Q&A session if it was appropriate or hadn't otherwise been addressed. But the ones that they will be asked to formally address are, how will you approach designing a building which will meet our net zero bylaw to get the greenest building possible and still stay within budget? Uh, question number two, if Amherst were to require the highest level of daylighting provision, contained in either CHIPS or LEED guidelines, which are sustainability guidelines. What would be your approach to daylighting for an elementary school project of this type? And the third one is Amherst lacks sufficient swing space to relocate elementary students during construction. Please comment on how this will affect your design approach. If possible, provide examples of how you have handled this in other cities and towns. So those are the five that they, they need to speak to directly, which does not mean there couldn't be more conversation in the Q&A, um, but it, it gives a certain level of um, grounding so that they're all kind of touching on the same five issues. And, and during the interviews that I watched, there were follow-up questions specific to, to the applicants that weren't necessarily in these five. And I'll note, Allison, one of the ones you suggested when I went to visit this one school that I liked a lot, I 
there was an art school teacher who was willing to talk to us. And I said, how's the building worked? And she said, it's generally great, but involve end users early because there's not enough storage space in the classroom. And you would, you know, and she was, she then showed us this pile of stuff along the wall because there wasn't a closet for it. So they were, so I think there are, you know, the approach and, and a few of these applicants actually talked about storage space. So, so I, I think that's it. Are there any other questions? There are questions for the people who weren't able to um, be one of us three on what we heard during the MSBA. They don't record these or put it up. So, okay. Then I think we'll move to number two on the agenda, which is, I, I think our next piece, Margaret, was to return to the discussion of the webpage. Yeah, and I don't have, oh, Mike, go ahead. Mike. So just because my time may get truncated, would uh, the committee and Kathy, would it be okay if I just did a 90 second update on sixth grade and school committee votes? Because I was on the agenda. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think I could do this really, really quickly and Ben jump in if, if you'd like. But uh, last week, the regional school committee voted to uh, accept seven in favor, one uh, opposed and one abstention. Uh, to allow towns to send their sixth grade students, if they so choose, one of the member towns to the middle school. So at this point, the Amherst School Committee has voted to send their sixth grade students to the middle school. The regional school committee has voted to accept those students in the regional middle school. There are logistics to work out in terms of uh, rental agreement and a bunch of items like that. But the two key votes that were needed have now taken place and they are done. So I do think that that will be relevant for the committee, especially if the designer gets on, because we, um, uh, with my regional hat on, we'll be expecting Amher sixth grade students to start attending in the fall of 2023, well ahead of where this project would be completed. It actually has implications, I believe, for one of the questions about swing space. It doesn't provide swing space, but it, you know we're gonna change our space usage in the elementary school starting in 2023 as well with the sixth grade leaving. So um, those two decisions and votes have taken place. And uh, I think there really aren't any other formal votes other than you know working against space rental agreement, some of the logistical details. Um, but that, that certainly gives this committee and then the architect and, and, and Margaret and Bob some direction in terms of uh, which way we're headed on this project. Thank you, Mike. And I, I, we brought this up at the MSBA meeting, but it wasn't clear to me how they then adjust because they've given us these two study populations. Um, so I think, Margaret, at some point, just clarifying with them as we making sure they understand that that vote has been taken and, yes. and when the architects come on. Thank you um, for that. So are we ready to move to the next item then? And let me just say, because Mike has to leave early, um, we, we will have a representative from Fort River. She's not on tonight. Um, so um, we will have a new member once she's appointed, Tamara Sullivan Daly. And for the next meeting, two weeks from now, what we talked about doing, so I do want, want to catch you while you're on, is um, having a discussion of how we have a sort of parallel or working group and to involve a, a larger group of people. So I want to make sure that is still an agreed on two weeks from now. I mean, we'll be able to report on what happened with the shortlist as well, but but have a, and people should come with ideas to that. So we, it's, it's uh, starting off. Okay, so web page, Margaret. So Kathy, I, Caroline was actually not able to join this morning. So I, I can't ask her to give us a visual update, but she and I are working on um, several uh, pieces that are gonna be featured on the opening page. And the goal, we should be able to send out some screenshots uh, next week so that people can see what that's going to look like. Okay. So that that's the, ex the extent of this. So Margaret, then you want to move to if there, the one that I listed as if we have time, um, you wanted to brief us on the reimbursement formula. Yeah. Um, so we can, I know that Mike's time, Mike, you have another 10 minutes. 
ish. Ish. Okay. 10, 10, 15, a little more than 10. Okay. Um, I think um, I'd like Mike to be um, here for this conversation. So I'm, I'm just going to summarize that um, I do want to have a conversation with the committee um, about uh, how the reimbursement rates work because we've experienced and we've seen in other communities, even projects, we're not working on a lot of confusion and misunderstanding about the reimbursement rates and, and how it works. And, you know, I, I want to say, um, start off by saying, I think, <clears throat> and I, I think we touched on this briefly before that the Mexico Building Authority is, is a relatively new invention. It had a predecessor, the School Building Authority. And um, the School Building Authority uh, process uh, was not particularly equitable, rather political. Um, and um, when the state kind of closed that organization down and then created the MSBA, it really was very much focused on equity. Um, however, they, the MSBA, the authority works within the guidelines of legislation, which is, you know, they were not participants and they were sort of give, they are given as their, their operating guidelines. And I would say the, <clears throat> the biggest confusion, I mean, basically they put caps on certain costs, um, which is again, to kind of equalize the playing field. And, and the, you know, the big ones are, um, they, they cap, they don't cap what any community can spend, but they do cap what they reimburse on. So some good examples um, for good reason are they cap what they will re reimburse on for designer and project manager fees. They cap um, one sort of big uh, category that is related to site design and that is site work. So they won't reimburse more than uh, site work that a cost that's more than 8% of the of the construction, total construction cost. And, you know, I think you can imagine that that is because um, what they don't want is for people to be folding in things that were more logically uh, municipal costs and not directly related to the school. However, 8% is a very low number for a large site. We have, we have done projects um, where we were able to say under the 8%, but it's been on very, very tight urban sites where the amount of actual physical site was very small. So this is um, the utility work, uh, the grading, the sidewalks, the you know paving, all of the stuff you, that sort of is the setting for the school. Um, and then um, the thing that is having the biggest impact at this point is that the um, again, the legislation caps um, the cost per square foot that uh, the MSBA will reimburse on. And the way the legislation is written, it is described as uh, eligible, they reimburse eligible costs. And, and this, is con this is confusing to people because most people say, well, Clearly, we wouldn't do anything that's not eligible, right? I mean, that's the whole point is to make us as eligible, eligible as possible. But eligible also includes this cap on construction costs per square feet, foot. And, and over the you know, last decade or so, the cost per square foot, the actual, what's actually happening in the market and cost per square foot um, has really kind of started to outpace the MSBA's cap. The MSBA does adjust it periodically, um, and it's been recently adjusted. And it may be, although I would be surprised, adjusted again before we set the project cost for this project. But it right now, I would say it's approximately, let me say, two thirds of the average actual cost per square foot. So the way that works in the funding formula is it means that about a third of the cost of the building is ineligible because of the cap. It's not because it's been over-designed. It's not because the spaces are too big. It's not because there's been some, you know, extraordinary profligacy. It's just, it's the market 
versus the legislation. And so I think that's really important because um, when, and I, because I didn't participate in the conversations the, the last time around for your earlier project, I don't know what was said in the community about this, but I wanted to see, you know, particularly interested um, Mike um, and anybody else who remembers the conversation, what was said and what might be understood, because I think um, we want to make sure, and it's probably, it's a feature for, for anyone in the community, but I think it's probably particularly important for uh, town council um, and anyone who would need to take, um, you know, be considered leaders on the project to understand this. So I'd like to get some feedback from all of you about what has been, what folks have heard before and understand and how we, um, who is important to wrap into that conversation early? Mike. Um, so, you know, I think it was talked about significantly last time that our official reimbursement rate, as I was remembering, Sean, I'm sure remembers, but was like 68% or something like that. But then the real, you know, in terms of the real reimbursement rate, it was closer to half. Um, yeah. And it's exactly because of the reasons you described. Um, yeah. It'd be interesting for other people to weigh in. I actually think that was, we didn't get a lot of, I don't recall that being a wedge issue last time that there was this gap mm -hmm. between what MSBA said our rate was and what it actually is. Uh, I think mm -hmm. the community really understood that pretty well. And I think there were other things that were less clear or more controversial um, last time, but Sean has his hand up and I'm sure he'll, he will uh, remember it well. Sean. Yeah, Mike, Mike, it was actually 67.3%, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think Mike's right. I think we were just clear from the beginning that there's a stated reimbursement rate and then there's an effective reimbursement rate and we sort of broke it down into those two categories. So um, people knew that from the beginning and all the estimates were sort of based on that effective reimbursement rate. Uh, so yeah, I don't remember being an issue. We just want to be clear from the beginning that whatever our stated rate is, it isn't necessarily what we're going to get reimbursed for the full project. Okay, that's great. And last time around, um, solar and the net zero weren't part of our bylaw. So um, I think that will affect the effective rate this time around, unless the state steps up or ARPA money or other money become available for this, the literally putting in the solar panels. Because, But correct me on whether MSBA now includes them as part of an allowable cost. I, I think the answer was Jonathan saying no, right? No, yeah. yeah. Not, to, not today. Not today. <clears throat> John, I, is Jonathan's hands up. I just wanted to say, I mean, by, I am not an expert on this, but my understanding, and it's kind of confirmed by the way uh, Margaret said it, is that um, in, in a way it almost doesn't, doesn't doesn't matter quite whether something's allowed to you know to be a part of the project or not because of that cap. Anything that's in it that's over the cap is our responsibility as a, as a community. Um, and I, I think as long as we can, you know, be clear and consistent and concise about talking about numbers all along you know so that that information's in the public um you know that that will that'll be one of the best things we can do to to keep confusion from from occurring uh, and it, it, you know it's it's, it's going to be a tough time to be looking at numbers because right now costs are are going up at a rate that's higher than typical and that will also be difficult for for you know the committee i'm sure and and members of the community to, to wrap their heads around on the previous project, was there um, a kind of cost calculator created or provided at all that people could go and sort of and you know enter their property assessment and get feedback on what the cost per household is? Yeah, That's been there's a common we, um, tool. Yeah, we've done that. It's actually on our, there's one on our website right now where you can plug in um, the cost of the school project and the the value of your home and get get a rough impact of what the debt exclusion, um, the additional tax impact would be from the project if we go the debt exclusion route. So we have that on our website now, but we'll probably want to update it because every year with the taxes change, we have to update it a little bit. That's great. That's good to know. I think that's a really helpful tool. 
you know, I mean, in general, what I think it's 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 better. Um, <clears throat> it's it's a really good idea to talk about what you're getting rather than what you're not getting. Um, and I think I, th I think I'm re accurately representing the MSBA on that. You know, that's their perspective as well. Like, you don't have to take our money. Um, but th this is what we can give you within within the guidelines that we have to operate under. Mar so, Margaret, that, when do you think we will? Um, do we? When do you? I know we have a stated reimbursement rate, which is a little bit lower than it was last time. When do you? Is it when the initial design is done that we'll have more of an idea of the effective rate? So, um, great question. The So there's sort of the, the first marker for what the possible cost of the project is um, at the end of the, um, the first submittal, the PDP submittal, um, we typically, uh, we're required actually to provide the, what the options that are gonna be looked at in the next step. Mm -hmm. So you do the program submittal, and there's a couple of other pieces, but it's mostly the program metal, the building of values, building and site evaluations, and then the, the last big piece, which points to the next pieces. And the committee has decided to look at this range of options. So, you know, as you know, you're required to look at three. In this case, we may have more. <laughs> I'm not encouraging this, but I've seen submittals that had up to 10. Um, you know, I think having been through the, the Fort River study, you know what that looks like pretty quickly when you have like lots and lots of iterations, but the PDP, you say this, and, and then you give a very high level, it's a cost per square foot um, range of what those are. And it, it's really what it's doing is it's stacking the options relative to each other, the cost relative to each other. I don't recommend relying on it. And we try to be very conservative when we generate those numbers. So that's the first point, but I wouldn't do a cost calculator based on those numbers. Um, then, and when you get to the point of pointing to the preferred schematic, so that's the next submittal. So now you, the next step is evaluate the options and pick the one you want. Then you're gonna do a detailed estimate of that one, which again is based on fairly conceptual design. Then you have something that starts to look like a real number. And then at the end, of, then the, the last stage is then to do the schematic design, which is the first step in the design, in the process of creating the, what will be the construction documents. Then you do, because now you've got rooms and room numbers and assemblies and all of this stuff, then you do a more detailed design. It's that, last number, which is usually the best number to use for the cost calculator. Um, and it is also the number that obviously goes in your, your vote language. And it's the number that the MSBA takes to review uh, before the board for their vote. Okay. And do you know if there are any, I know they got rid of some of these, are there any incentive points anymore for different things? I know there was incentives last time around for if you built a lead Gold yeah. school do those incentives still exist yes a number okay. of them still exist and, and the th ones those that... aren't in our rate right now right those because we haven't designed mm -hmm. the school correct they okay. get added on to the base rate um the base reimbursement rate um and the couple that i know will end up applying to you is there are points for you know green building which in the msba guidelines is mostly defined by lead um, or chips um, which is why it was mentioned in the MSBA's question about building information systems. There are also points for building maintenance. So they'll review, and I'm sure they did this the last time around, review your um, maintenance um, program. Uh, and uh, there's a couple of other outstanding, but th those are the ones that for a community like this typically generate um, the most points. There's some other things that have fallen by the wayside. At one point there was for projects before a certain date. And I, this would, this one would be incorporated that there was a point for um, utilizing um, construction management at risk, but that sort of timed out at this point. So there's no point for that. 
Um, so those are the big ones, sustainability, energy, particularly energy performance and uh, maintenance uh, program. So I see two hands, both Jonathan and Mike had their hands up. Mike seems to have gone down, but <laughs> okay, Jonathan. I just wanted to ask uh, that, what, what's, what is the stage that that, that that last number you were talking about is at the end of the schematic design phase? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that, yeah. that then becomes the target budget uh, that the designer is working to for the rest of the project, or is there, or is it more yeah. loose than that? Okay. No, no, it's it's okay. the target target budget, and and so thank you for bringing this up, Jonathan, because this is a really important point, um, which I think is going to come into play as we, as the designer comes on board. So. Um, the schedule for this project was always like pretty fast to get to a vote a year from now, a local vote. Um, you know, with the time we lost um, with the air and the advertising, it's become compressed. Um, when the de designer comes on board, we will look really closely with them at how much time is needed for schematic design because their ability to generate an accurate set of bid documents for estimating that it be really something that we can depend on to capture the cost is critical. Because if once that budget is set, if that number becomes the basis of your funding agreement with the MSBA. And if the project cost goes up, that the funding agreement, I think understandably basically says that is on you. So you find contaminated soils you didn't find before, that's on you. <laughs> you find out that there's you know, some other cost that you didn't anticipate, that's on you. So that number, like what comes out of the schematic design estimate is the number that you are tied to for the rest of the project. And you, it really, you need to have the, this, this is why I'm not gonna say what that duration should be. It really has to be the designer looking at the project and their team and deciding whether, uh, you know, how much time they need to do it. Mike? No, no more. Yeah, I actually have to run uh, to the dentist, I'd rather stay with you all, but not, <laughs> not what Dr. Perry would, uh, would agree to. So, um, uh, no, really, thanks, everybody. And I remember what I said earlier, the conversations have been really uh, influential in, you know, kind of my role yesterday and will continue to be as we go back to interviews um, two weeks from yesterday. So uh, thanks again. I hope everyone has a great day. Hi, Mike. Now, have fun. I, I have a question just on timing. Um, M Margaret has regularly said if we want to have it in a vote a year from now, but um, Paul, we... In terms of a vote on the school, we can do that any time, right? It doesn't have to be, I know uh, money-wise, if you're running an election, it's easier to put a ballot question up, but we can put a ballot question up, a referendum anytime. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And you know, I think the goal would be to do it at an, a regularly scheduled election because you get a bigger turnout. So you get a better sense of the community, um, but the council can, choose to put it on, choose any day at once. Uh, we just have to follow all the normal protocols that come into place when you hold an election, like registration in advance and all the kind of stuff that goes with it. So we always, you know, I think it's always wise to continue to drive towards the November election in 2022, but recognize that that's a pretty challenging goal. Yeah, and that's the only reason I asked it. You know, I realize it's challenging, but if we end up needing two or three more months, it doesn't mean that we have to wait till the next no, you know, November, 2023. And for those who don't closely follow the Amherst elections, the turnout this time was about 30%. Um, so it was a lot lower than it was for the first council election, but that election occurred with state elections at the same time. And it was the first council, but it was, I'm gonna say a lot lower, it was quite a bit lower, um, even yeah. though we had Right, yeah. the 2022 election will be a state election. Yeah, so we'll be back on, a, there, there'll be another election that we're tied to. So any other questions on this? Um, so the one other, before I open it up for public comments, that we can take comments from, on anything from the committee, I did want to um, 
on the what we agreed on for the two weeks from now, and so I will post that meeting, is to come with ideas of a working group, if we call it a, um, it's not an ad hoc group, so it's not just our committee, but we bring other people on, whether it's teachers, um, other community members that would be helping with public forums with outreach, but also as the designer comes on with content. So come, come with ideas of, you know, what kinds of people should be on it, how big it should be, um, any experiences last time around with the Wildwood projects that people were part of. Um, you know, I've, I've been asked a couple of times, do we have teachers on the building committee? Um, and the answer is not yet, but, but that, that would be the main topic. And then we would also be re reporting on, we, we're going down from three to one, um, and we won't have negotiated a contract yet with them, but we can be reporting on it. Mike, uh, Paul, yeah, I'm just seeing your hands up. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think we would look to Margaret for some guidance on you know what's the best practice for involving the community and setting up groups like this because we don't have to reinvent the wheel. They, we've done you know dozens and dozens of buildings, and there are probably communities that have done a really good job at, in, at doing this type of work. So I think instead of us just sort of brainstorming randomly, it'd be really good if we knew what other cities and towns have done to involve their their constituents and groups. Their stakeholder groups okay and we can all look at it ourselves too i think you know so, so any go, go on go ahead well, I, do you want me to comment on that or do you want to take it up when we talk about the committee next time who might be on this um you you make a brief comment and then if you want to come in with any more detailed thoughts next time yeah so um, I so I think there's a there's an important distinction that needs to be made here between communications and um, let me call it uh, I'm not sure advocacy is the right word. So uh, as I, I think everybody on this group knows, you, you can't spend public money advocating for a project, right? And I want to have a separate discussion about what you can and cannot do. Cause there's lots of things you can do. Like as individuals, you can say, I think everyone can su support this project. What you can't do is spend public money, the co this committee or any committee that is um, sort of identified and kind of given a, a role, a formal role in this can't spend money. So what I typically see is that there is a group that is doing advocacy which is independent of this, but might be informed by um, an ad hoc committee who were, you know, thinking about how to communicate. If that makes sense, it's. A, I mean, it's a little bit of a fine line, but that's the way I would think about it. Paul. Yeah. So I don't think that's what Kathy's referencing. That's an, that is an advocacy group for a question that's on the ballot. And you're right. That's a totally separate process. I think yeah. Kathy, you're talking more about how do we involve more people into the design considerations? Is that what you're thinking, Kathy? Yeah. And 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 also just as we're confronting a decision that we know we're going to be making, how do we do a public forum? How do we do outreach in a way that enough people know that that decision's coming up and they can be, are we using the, the school apparatus at each school where we do a parent teacher organization? So just trying to think through how, um, before we make the final decision on wh where we're building, that people are invited in and get information and are there different voices that might reach more people so that Phoebe particularly raised this last time as a uh -huh. way it's a way of informing and it's way before advocacy it's just that yeah. people know people know we're we're down to we're going to have to make a decision on this and what do we know and then yeah. and then, and then um, we get input just on other people's. Um, they they talked to a, a couple of the proposals talked about this, trying to feel about what is the town's been thinking about this for a while, and we want to also hear from hear from the town. Like we can provide you with information. So I think it's that kind of group, Paul. That yeah. without making this group enormous, you know, getting some more people to do that legwork, thought work. Um, ben is our 
a school committee member, but some of the school committee me other members also are tied to the community in a way that they would have ideas about how to to broaden the discussion before we make a decision, not um, yeah, you know, to, not to be at the table making the decision. Yeah, and you know, I I'm I, just to be clear, I'm clarifying clarifying this for anyone who may be listening because this is an important distinction, right? I I think those of you who are already sort of working for the town particularly, I think are aware of, you know, this, this line, but um, I wanna make sure that anybody listening does not think we're forming an advocacy group, we're forming a group to communicate. Yeah. All right, so seeing any other comments or questions, um, seeing none, I will open it up to public comments. And we have four attendees and one person has their name up, uh, their hand up. Um, so Bruce, I'm inviting you in. I think you are now, Bruce, you should be able to talk if you unmute. Okay, um, two quick comments. First is really quick. Um, I don't know about others who are regularly attending these, but I certainly would appreciate knowing who the attendees are to the extent that this is a public meeting. If it were a real regular old fashioned public meeting, I would come into the room. I would know who was there and um, I would know who would, you know, I would, I would know who was there. Um, so I think it, would it be possible perhaps at the beginning of the public comment section to just read the list of uh, attendees? That's a question, doesn't need to be answered right now. It's just something that if it were possible, I would appreciate it and it would be more like a re regular public meeting. Secondly, um, uh, apropos of the, uh, this expanded, uh, this group that you were just discussing, um, it seems to me that one uh, useful uh, and very pointed immediate focus would be, I think Margaret, you have on your um, schedule somewhere around April or March or somewhere in the spring, um, the owner's uh, project requirements or the design program, there's a document that really is, the, it's, it's, it seems to me one of the basic documents of any design process is mm -hmm. being generated. And, and for filling that uh, uh, document out would be something that certain uh, folks that are probably interested in this process would be very useful and uh, could be quite constructively involved in, uh, in, in contributing to that thought process, that accumulation. I'm thinking particularly of teachers. Um, I was with Kathy when we went to these schools and we did uh, go inside and it was clear that the, 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 um, the design program could have been better uh, and more accurately uh, and more fulsomely constructed. If uh, teachers had have been uh, involved, this seems like a very good uh, process for doing that. Some of Rupert's concerns, uh, which I share as well as an architect, on uh, building maintenance, durability, um, and complexities and so forth, again, could be uh, uh, plumbed a little bit uh, through uh, folks that were um, interested in this process, had some time, some experience, and could be led to focus on those kind of questions. I think it's a very useful potential um, uh, support group or however it's going wants to be named um, and, um, and and that uh, design program as owner's project owner's project requirement document would seem to be a, a really constructive first focus for this kind of activity thank you thank you bruce okay we have Kathy, <clears throat> yes Kathy, yeah. can i just say one thing um sure. relative to the you know who's in the room um, I, I wanted to formally introduce Bob Stevens, <laughs> who works with me, because I know that those of you who participate, who were part of our interviews or were able to listen to our interviews, will have met Bob Stevens, but Bob is actually my partner in crime on this. Um, he lives in Westfield, and um, he's been in the background, but I'm going to be asking him to join meetings more often. And so I wanted to make sure everybody understood who he was on the screen and why he's a panelist and not a member of the public, so. Thank you. Um, you know, I'll find out just on attendees, that's been a, a question on other meetings. 
on how we can do it. There are three people right now, um, and one I, um, I, I'm not going to read out the names, but we'll figure out whether we can make that more like who else is in the room. We, there is one other um, hand up, and I'm going to promote this person um, to panelists. Please say who you are. Uh, I think I promoted you, Tony. Yes. Welcome, Tony. You can unmute. Hi. Uh, yeah, so my question is about the educational plan. I believe that's one of the key steps coming up shortly. And I haven't heard any discussion or very little discussion in this committee about it. I realize it falls on the school committee and they have it on the agenda for December 14th as a first discussion, um, the Amherst Elementary School Committee, and then on January 11th as a vote. So in between those dates, we have the holidays. Um, my concern is that the public has not yet been involved in this process. And there's some big decisions that I think go into the educational plan. Maybe Margaret can clarify that. For example, uh, we have three specialized programs, as you know, at um, currently located at Fort River and at Wildwood. Will those three programs be offered at both this consolidated school and at Crocker Farm? And what implications would that have for space needs at both buildings? Um, if there's a shortage of space at Crocker Farm, will the preschool have to move? I realize that doesn't directly fall under the purview of this building committee, but it is something that is of concern to me. And the dual language program, this could offer an opportunity to expand the program. There's been a lot of interest and some people have not been able to get a spot in it. Um, would we be looking at expanding the dual language program to be possibly three or four classes at this consolidated school? Would Crocker Farm students have equal opportunity to participate in it? And all of these decisions have implications to the space summaries that, that you will be drafting for the MSBA and the design of the building. So I would love to hear more discussion about these topics in, and get them out into the public realm before they're decided. Because so I think once that educational plan is voted, and, and I'm not sure you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, Margaret, but I'm not sure how easy it is to change it later. Um, so there are some of my concerns. And then also, I just want to echo the desire to involve stakeholders early, especially teachers and uh, parents, and also trying to reach the parents of zero to five year olds, because they'll probably be the first cohort in this building. And um, there's many preschools in the area and daycares in the area that you could reach out to, to get involved in this process. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, you know, we, our practice is not normally not to respond to comments as they come in, but um, we were clearly um, take these down and we can, it will be a topic. One of the issues um, that all the designer proposals have in it is an educational plan. And we've got an, the same person basically on all three proposals who will be coming in and working on that. So any other, uh, I, no other hands are up on public. Um, so we, and so I wanna take this moment for any other comments, um, comments on upcoming meetings? Once the designer is selected, we'll be able to probably put out a schedule of how often we're meeting. But right now, it will be two weeks from now. And then we have talked about two weeks after that, that first week in December will be when we're inviting, hopefully we've negotiated the contract and we have a designer on board and that that meeting would focus on meeting that team, hearing what they have to say about milestones, et cetera. So that is the current, my best guess of the next two meetings. And then we will have to be working with them on what can be done in, at each of the intervals. We, as everyone knows, we're hitting Thanksgiving and we're hitting Christmas. So we, we're not going to try to have you give up other vacation plans. Um, any other questions or comments? I don't see any. So I think we can adjourn the meeting. And Kathy, thank there is you. one more hand up in the um, attendee list. I don't know if you Oh, another, oh, there is another. Okay, thank you, Sean. Okay, so I am going to, I don't know who this is. I'm, how do I? allowed to talk. This is a person on the phone calling in. Can you please say who you are, where you live? And you are on, unmute. 
I hope I am unmuted. You are unmuted. Am I? Okay. Hi, this is Maria Kopicki from South Amherst. So I want to comment about uh, reimbursement. You did mention that there's uh, reimbursement points available for maintenance. That's up to two percentage points, at least it was historically. There's also up to five percentage points for renovation, and that wasn't mentioned. And I think that's extraordinarily important to talk about because as you start to discuss different ways to approach this project, that's going to be something that needs to be addressed and needs to be given very thoughtful consideration and fair consideration. Uh, um, and I'd like you to comment on that and bring that into the discussion as you talk about reimbursement and as you talk about design options. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And Maria is correct, and that was my oversight not to mention that. So the MSBA does um, encourage the reuse of buildings through the use of um, reimbursement points. Um, so they, <clears throat> if you, as Maria says, there's a total of five points, and depending on how much of a building you reuse and how much you build new, it's sort of prorated. The percentage points are prorated. Okay, now I think that's um, the only hand that's up, I think is the same person who just spoke. Is that correct? Good. Thank you, Sean, for looking at hands. They don't always appear on my screen. So then I think we can um, adjourn today's meeting um, and hopefully get ready for the intensity that will happen once we have a designer on board. Thank, I thank you everybody for joining early morning and the meeting, I'm going to officially say this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, Elle. See.